Hello, my name is Manu Hegde. I'm a group leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England. And this is the third in a series of three talks. And what we've been discussing is how proteins inside the cell are selectively compartmentalized among the different organelles. And in this particular talk, I want to talk a little bit about how you get very high fidelity in recognition of the localization signals. So to remind you, um, most of the proteins inside the cell, uh, shortly after they're synthesized, have to be segregated among one of several different organelles. And that can range from the endoplasmic reticulum over here, mitochondria, peroxisomes, nucleus, and so forth. And a major problem has been to try to understand the mechanisms by which you can get all of these different proteins sorted into the right compartment with high fidelity. And what we learned in the first talk is some of the very basic principles of how this is accomplished. In short, proteins typically have signal sequences or other elements that are specifically recognized by machinery that's dedicated to different organelles. And so, for example, proteins that go to the endoplasmic reticulum have one set of machinery. Proteins for mitochondria have another. And these machinery ensure that you can get recognition of these signals and get the proteins to the right part of the cell. In addition, because of failures in these processes from time to time, the cell has also evolved machinery for degrading proteins that fail to get to the right place. And what we learned in the second part of the, the series is that even slight increases in the amount of failures is sufficient to cause diseases. And so over long periods of time, even one protein that's out of place, let's say two or three times more than it's supposed to be, can, in some circumstances, cause diseases like neurodegeneration. And what this really raised in our minds is, given that one protein at, uh, uh, out of place can cause that, and the cell has to deal with literally thousands of proteins to get to the right place, clearly getting reasonably good fidelity of localization is an important problem for the cell. So how is this actually accomplished? And I want to try to address this for proteins that go to the endoplasmic reticulum. So to remind you, proteins that wind up either on the surface of the cell over here or outside the cell, these blue proteins, initially start their synthesis at the endoplasmic reticulum. So ribosomes that synthesize them dock at the ER surface and either translocate the protein across the membrane or insert it into the membrane. And these proteins then traffic to their final destinations. And the question is, how are the signals that are recognized here to get them to the right place and across the membrane um, recognized with high fidelity by the respective machinery? And so to remind you what this machinery is, Here's an example of a protein that winds up in the lumen of the ER and the steps that lead from when it first starts getting synthesized to get to the lumen. So shortly after it begins synthesis, the protein exposes a signal sequence, which is depicted in blue here. And that sequence, which is typically hydrophobic, is recognized by a factor called signal recognition particle. And SRP acts on the ribosome itself and recognizes this protein as it's coming out of the ribosomal exit tunnel. SRP then has a receptor at the membrane, and that receptor, called SRP receptor, abbreviated SR here, um, then helps with the transfer of the protein to another factor called SEC61. And SEC61 is a component of the protein translocation channel. And what happens is that once you get transferred to SEC61, the signal is again recognized, and it has to successfully engage the SEC61 channel. And what I mean by engagement is it has to not only be recognized, but somehow open this channel so that in later steps, you can then get a pore that forms across the membrane and translocation of the protein across the membrane. At some point during this translocation process, the signal peptide gets cleaved by a specific enzyme, and eventually, you get translocation of the whole protein across the membrane into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the same machinery, it turns out, also deals with integral membrane proteins. And this can be seen in a couple of different ways. So for example, if a protein is being synthesized, then synthesizes a transmembrane segment, also shown in blue here, that hydrophobic sequence is allowed to laterally move into the lipid bilayer so that you can make an integral membrane protein 
that spans the lipid bilayer. And so what you have is a machinery that then has to recognize proteins both for targeting to the ER, for opening of the channel, and for insertion into the membrane. And so this process, of course, has to occur not just for one protein that has to go to the ER, but for literally thousands of different proteins. And so the signal recognition protein particle, uh, the signal recognition particle pathway is thought to deal with roughly 5,000 to 6,000 different proteins in our genome. And these proteins vary considerably. Some of them span the membrane just once. Many of them are secreted and go all the way into the lumen. Uh, many of them span the membrane multiple times. And all of these proteins have sequences that need to be recognized for these processes. And every single one of those sequences is unique. And so the question then is, how do you get recognition of such a diverse range of sequences? And how do you do it with reasonably high fidelity, which we think is quite important because even slight inefficiencies and failures can have significant consequences over time. So what you really want to understand, I think, are two key steps. The first one, shown all the way on the left, is the signal recognition particle and how it recognizes signal peptides. The second one is how the SEC61 channel recognizes signal peptides in order to open. And so how, how can we do this? And what you really want to do is you want to look at these specific steps in the process with a high degree of resolution. And what you'd ideally like to do is to have some degree of molecular level uh, insight into the nature of the interaction between SRP and the signal peptide and SEC61 and the signal peptide. However, there are a number of different challenges to looking at these complexes by high resolution structural approaches. For example, the best resolution structural approaches, such as X-ray crystallography or NMR, require large amounts of homogeneous sample. However, these steps are specific steps in a co-translational pathway. So the process occurs during protein synthesis, which means it's very difficult to not only get homogeneous sample, but to get it in uh, large amounts. The second problem is that these complexes are enormous. So in the eukaryotic system, for example, the ribosome is composed of some 80 or so proteins, many RNAs. SRP is composed of six different proteins and RNAs. And these proteins are very difficult to, for example, coax into crystals. And the third problem is that it's very likely that these interactions themselves are either flexible or dynamic. And so with these challenges, then it's been very difficult to get high resolution information on the nature of these interactions. So the approach that's typically been taken in the past is this divide and conquer strategy. And the strategy here is you take a, a protein complex like SRP and you cut it up into small pieces, so either individual proteins or individual domains of proteins that you can then crystallize. And the hope is that by eventually piecing together these smaller parts into a larger whole, you can gain some insight into how the machinery works. But it's been quite challenging to try to see the native complexes in action. The main approach that's been available to look at such large complexes has been electron microscopy. And I'll describe in a, in, in a little bit more detail later, but the basic idea is that one can take such samples, and one doesn't need a large amount of them, and reconstruct three-dimensional uh, structures using the electron microscope. However, until recently, such structures have been relatively limited in what kind of resolution they provide. So these are, these are groundbreaking studies by the Beckman lab or the Aki and Rappaport labs that have informed about where on the ribosome, which is shown in blue and yellow, um, complexes such as SRP sit and its overall organization. And one can use such structures to dock X-ray structures of individual components to get an overall idea of what these structures look like. But if you want to see what the actual interactions are in the native complex, that turns out to be quite a bit more challenging. And there are a number of reasons why this has been a problem. But for example, if you are looking here at the SEC61 translocon, um, you can see that because this component is embedded in a lipid bilayer, you have to extract it out of that bilayer 
and it's then surrounded by lipids and detergents, which interfere with the ability to see what you want to see. And that, combined with other limitations to the resolution, have made it very difficult to see molecular interactions between, say, the signal peptide and SRP, or the signal peptide and SEC61, in a level of detail that gives insight into how recognition occurs. So that's the challenge. And I will say that um, it's certainly quite impressive that over the course of 60 years since this electron micrograph was taken and those images I just showed you, we have much better resolution views of what ribosomes, which are these dark, dense particles here, look like when they're targeting a protein or when they're docked on a membrane. But the molecular details of those interactions has been quite a challenge. So of course, we were, for the most part, spectators in trying to understand these events at, at molecular resolution. And what happened is that then um, Rebecca Voorhees joined my lab. And Rebecca, it turns out, came from Venki Ramakrishnan's lab down the hall from me at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology. And in Venki's lab, Rebecca had a friend, Israel Fernandez. And Israel, not only was he interested in structures of the ribosome and so on, as, as was Venki's major interest, but was particularly interested in applying electron microscopy methods to these problems. And so it turns out that uh, the LMB has been a pioneer in developing many of the tools for um, uh, high resolution electron microscopy. And Rebecca, via her friendship with Israel, kept hearing about the latest developments, not only in detecting the EM samples from frozen EM samples, but also in the computational aspect of reassembling 3D structures from otherwise very noisy images. And so at some point then, Rebecca decided she really wanted to learn how to do uh, EM, use cryo-electron microscopy to solve structures. And so we sat down and decided on what we should initially look at. And what we decided was that at least as a starting point to get practice in how we can uh, use the EM, how we can assemble structures and so on, we would start actually from a source that has lots and lots of ribosomes engaged in the process we're interested in. So this EM picture, taken in the 1950s or 60s by George Pallotti, depicts the pancreas. And the pancreas is dedicated to secreting tons and tons of enzymes. So what's happening here is almost all the ribosomes here are associated with the ER membrane, and they're in the process of translocating proteins across that membrane into the lumen. And so we thought, well, we, we could just start here. And so what we did was we took pancreas and converted them into ER microsomes. So these are now vesicles in which the surface of these vesicles is studded with various ribosomes that are hopefully engaged in, in uh, translocation with the SEC61 complex. And we then solubilize these in mild detergent. And our lab had quite a bit of experience in um, the biochemical properties of ribosome translocon interactions. And so what we did was we solubilized the membranes under conditions where such interactions were maintained, and then just isolated large particles. Because in this image, after you get rid of the membrane, the ribosomes are the largest components present in the sample. And then we applied those samples to an EM grid, which was then plunge frozen. And so what you get then is a picture which I suspect is very hard for you to see, but contains individual ribosomal particles in this picture. And this picture is inherently noisy, and that's because the, the dose of electrons used to image it is quite low to limit the damage. But within this noisy uh, picture of individual ribosomes are hopefully ribosomes that are seen in various different orientations. And what one can do, and I'm simplifying quite a bit here, is that you can take a large number of such images, select individual ribosomal particles from them, and then computationally, if you have a variety of different views of that ribosome, reconstruct what the structure must have looked like. And so if the particles are heterogeneous, there are additional methods to segregate the particles into different subclasses and reconstruct multiple structures from such a sample. So this is what Rebecca did. And we uh, started this project, and then I didn't hear anything for a couple of months. And then one day, Rebecca comes into the lab, and she's literally jumping up and down. And all she's saying is, I can see helices. 
And I have really no idea what she's talking about. But it turns out that she had gotten an initial reconstruction of uh, about 80,000 of these particles. And this is the kind of image that she was able to see. And so if you're like me uh, at that time, it was a bit difficult to understand exactly what you're looking at here. So let me just give you a tour through what this structure represents. And so these movies that I'm going to show you are made possible by Aaron Lewis, a graduate student in the lab, who helped uh, give you a tour through this. So what you're looking at here is a reconstruction of about 80,000 ribosomal particles from the microsomes. And it's colored light blue for the large subunit of the ribosome, yellow for the small subunit, and the SEC61 channel is colored red. And in this particular view, the membrane would be right here. So it, so it goes right through the uh, center of SEC61, and uh, presumably the protein would be translocating this way across the membrane. So we'll turn the ribosome now so that the SEC61 is immediately facing you, and the plane of the membrane here is essentially where the screen is. And if you cut away this X61, you can see that it's sitting where it should be, right at the end of the tunnel that's inside the ribosome through which newly synthesized proteins emerge. So X61 is sitting right where proteins first come out of the ribosome. So if we then turn it to the other side and make the small subunit transparent, you can then see that the entrance to that tunnel is sitting between the two subunits of the ribosome, which is where peptidyl transfer occurs, that is, new peptide bonds are formed. And the protein then goes through the center of the ribosomal uh, large subunit to emerge on the other side. Now, if we turn the ribosome to a more canonical view, this is the view that you often see in textbooks that depict translation. Um, here's where the mRNA would go. It would uh, basically snake across the uh, small subunit. And translation factors would bind over here. So this is where new uh, tRNAs are brought to the ribosome for assembly into proteins. So we'll now focus on the part that we're most interested in, which is the SEC61. And if we zoom in on the SEC61 complex, what you can see is, again, here's where the membrane plane is, um, is that individual helices of SEC61 are visible. In fact, you can even see, even in this initial reconstruction, that this looks helical, and you can even see the pitch of the helices. You can then sharpen the density maps that give rise to these uh, images. And when you do that, one gets even better resolution of the SEC61, and it's, you can see, quite easy to trace the backbone of the SEC61 complex through this experimental density. The density here is shown in mesh, in gray, and the trace of the backbone that we deduce from it is shown in red. And so given that there is already known structural information from a homologue of SEC61 from Archaea, derived from Tom Rappaport's group by X-ray crystallography, it was possible to construct a model of the SEC61 complex from that of the mammalian complex. In addition, if you look in the ribosome itself, the resolution was absolutely stunning. So you can see here that the side chains of different parts of the ribosome uh, are easily fitted into the density, which again is shown in this gray mesh. And so Israel, whose interest was in, was in uh, the ribosome, uh, worked with Rebecca to build an atomic model of the ribosome, which turned out to be the first very high resolution atomic model of the mammalian ribosome. And together, they constructed an atomic model of the mammalian ribosome and SEC61 complex. And so, um, it turns out that this ribosome SEC61 complex was primarily empty, so that it wasn't actually translating anything. And that turns out to be probably my fault, because it was just a practice sample. The sample that we used to, to um, analyze was actually made from microsomes that I made when I was a student about 20 years ago. And so, almost certainly, all part of the proteins that were being synthesized when that pancreas was first harvested had long since been hydrolyzed and, and gone. But nevertheless, what this told us was that it was possible to start seeing at atomic or near atomic resolution details of not only the ribosome, but also of the SEC61 complex. And so what we could then do was turn our attention to other problems. And in the, in, and in the subsequent time, uh, since that initial structure, um, we, as well as others, 
have uh, used such methods to look at intermediates in translation, intermediates in quality control processes at the ribosome, or what, what we're interested in here for this talk, um, intermediates in the translocation process. And so the question we want to try to address then is, um, what exactly do these uh, intermediates, if I can go back for a second, do these intermediates of the uh, SRP interacting with the signal or SEC61 interacting with the signal look like? And ideally, what you would like is a structure before and after recognition of the signal in each case. So you can hope to deduce the kind of conformational changes that might occur that allow specific recognition. So to do this, we generated a sample using in vitro translation. And so here, the idea is that uh, you could, of course, in an in vitro lysate, so this lysate is composed of a cytosol that contains all the factors for translation, um, with which you can program a specific mRNA that allows you to synthesize some protein of interest. And so we designed and generated a protein that contains a hydrophobic sequence that we believe should be recognized by SRP and is targeted by that pathway. And then we modified the system in the following way. First, we used a truncated mRNA that allows the ribosome to get to a point where the hydrophobic sequence has come out of the ribosome um, but remains attached via the last tRNA because the ribosome with, with no further mRNA to, to translate winds up stalling at the very end of this mRNA. And so you have an exposed signal, and that would recruit endogenous SRP. So what we're looking at then is an endogenous ribosome that's present just in the cytosol that recruits endogenous SRP from the same sample. So these are, these are native complexes, and the only thing we've done is engineered it with a protein that has an exposed signal and a further engineering of an affinity tag at the very end terminus so we could fish this out specifically. We then prepared a parallel sample in which the hydrophobic sequence, in this case, is buried inside the ribosome. And the reason we did this was there was uh, earlier experimental work that had suggested that when hydrophobic sequences are inside the ribosome, um, SRP can, through mechanisms we don't understand, be recruited to those ribosomes. And we verified that that, in fact, is the case in the mammalian system. And that allowed us to have a sample before the signal is recognized and a sample after the signal is recognized. And by comparing these two samples, you'll see that we're able to try to deduce the nature of this interaction. So one can then use the same EM methods to reconstruct uh, a, a picture of the, what the ribosome SRP complex looks like. And again, I'll give you a brief tour through what this, look, this uh, structure looks like. So colored very similarly as before, the large subunit here is in light blue, and the small subunit of the ribosome in yellow, and SRP is in green. And you can see that SRP snakes around much of the large subunit, with part of it sitting at the intersubunit interface here. And you might be able to see deep inside the ribosome a tRNA. And that's because this ribosome should be translating our protein of interest. And that is, in fact, the case, because if you make the small subunit transparent, you can then see there's a tRNA shown here in purple um, in the P site of the ribosome. And that tRNA, if we now turn this around a bit and make the large subunit uh, transparent, winds up being attached to a peptide. And that peptide is going through the tunnel inside the ribosome. And it becomes a little bit harder to see at the end of the tunnel because the tunnel widens a bit over there. But then if we zoom in to the part of SRP that should be binding the signal peptide, um, we can see that uh, you can see part of the nascent chain there as well, shown here in, in blue. So the region of SRP here that is binding the signal peptide is called the M domain. And the M domain in isolation, or at least most of the M domain in isolation, has been studied earlier by crystallography methods. So there are high resolution structures of the M domain from various species. And that's what allows us to know that this is what the M domain looks like and that this is extra density for the signal peptide. So let's take a closer look at just that region. 
And again, for orientation, the protein coming out of the ribosome comes out right here. And so the M domain that binds the signal sits right at the mouth of the ribosomal exit tunnel, ready to capture the signal. So here's the same view that you saw previously. And what's shown in green is the X-ray structure of human SRP M domain. And you can see that it fits into the experimental density quite nicely, and that there's extra density at the center of this claw. So, so the M domain looks kind of like this. And in the center of this is some extra density, which we can assign to the signal that was uh, uh, in our sample. In addition to that extra density, we saw two other pieces of density that we couldn't account for. And those are labeled C1 and C2. And the reason we called them C1 and C2 is because in these X-ray structures of the M domain, the C terminus was always cut off. And that's because the C terminus seems to interfere in some way with crystallization. And so those were removed. And because we couldn't account for those uh, in the known X-ray structure, and this was extra density, we assigned these to the C-terminal regions of, of SRP54 M domain. Now, those C-terminal regions uh, had not really been the focus of much attention because they tend not to be particularly well conserved. However, when one looks more closely, it turns out that there's always a C-terminal helix, or in the case of mammals, two helices. And although the specific sequence isn't uh, necessarily well conserved, it turns out that these helices are always amphipathic. And what one means by amphipathic is that they form a helix such that one surface of the helix is hydrophobic and the other surface is hydrophilic. And what we imagined is that because the signal is hydrophobic, that these helices probably sit here in an orientation such that the hydrophobic surface faces the signal and the hydrophilic surface faces the aqueous solvent and the ribosome on the other side. And so what we think then is happening is that this SRP54 um, M domain is cradling the signal peptide right in the center here, and that it's covered by what essentially amounts to a lid formed by these two helices. And what's the, the, the coloring scheme here is yellow is hydrophobic, and uh, blue or purple is hydrophilic, and you can see that the the, 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 uh, the central cavity of this claw is very hydrophobic, which matches with the ability to bind a signal peptide. So what then does the structure look like before the signal is engaged? And so here um, on the top again is the, is the structure I've just shown you in almost the same view. There's the signal there, and then these are the two helices, C1 and C2, um, that form a, a, a lid over the, the, the signal. And then when you look at the other complex here, um, what we had initially expected, perhaps naively, is that the density that would disappear between here and here would, of course, be the density for the signal. And that's because here, the signal is still inside the ribosome. But in fact, the density that's missing here is the density where helix C2 used to be. And after a moment of thought, we realized what clearly must have happened is that when you have the central hydrophobic cavity of this claw unoccupied in this structure, the amphipathic helix, C2, simply moves in and occupies that claw. And again, remember that amphipathic means that one surface of it is hydrophobic, which would match very well with the hydrophobic surface of this cavity. And so what we think happens is that when a signal peptide is not bound, the spot where the signal peptide is going to bind is occupied by a placeholder. So here's a picture of roughly what we think is, is going on in terms of uh, the two conformations. So in the uh, state where the signal peptide is not bound, here is the structure of that part of the M domain. And there's a placeholder sitting in the cavity of this M domain. And at some point when the signal peptide binds, that placeholder moves out of the way, and the signal sits here, and that placeholder now serves as a lid to this cavity. And so what that accomplishes is that, therefore, the signal, which is hydrophobic and prone to aggregation or inappropriate interactions, is completely well shielded from the uh, hydrophilic and aqueous solvent. So if we then take a step back and look at how this fits into the overall function of SRP, 
what you imagine is that ribosomes that are in the process of translating a protein are probably being uh, sampled once in a while by SRP. And although we don't understand the mechanism, we think that SRP can be recruited to ribosomes when they begin synthesizing a hydrophobic domain. So when a significant portion of the hydrophobic domain has been synthesized but is still inside the ribosomal tunnel, um, SRP is recruited to those ribosomes. And what's going on uh, in detail at the region where the signal is going to be recognized is that that amphipathic placeholder sitting right here is probably dynamically coming in and out of that spot. And the nascent protein that's being synthesized by the ribosome is passing right in front of it, right, right here. And so the idea is that the sequences of the nascent protein, if they're hydrophilic, would not be able to occupy this hydrophobic groove, and therefore this amphipathic placeholder would, would remain there. But at some point, the sequence that comes out of the ribosome will be sufficiently hydrophobic that what's going to happen is that that SRP, which, is, which has basically been waiting there, will now bind that signal, which is shown in blue here, and that that placeholder will be displaced. And so the idea then is that only signals that are sufficiently hydrophobic to efficiently and stably displace that placeholder will be recognized by SRP. And from that point, the signal is shielded, and this complex would be taken to the surface of the ER, where you would get successful targeting. So um, the next step, of course, after you get to the ER, is you need to find that translocation channel and ideally have the signal, if it's a real bona fide signal, open that translocation channel. So how does that happen? So if we look at the steps that would be needed to open such a channel, of course, uh, when nothing is happening, the SEC61 channel would be in its quiescent state. And then it's, it's long been speculated based on biochemical data that when you first arrive at the channel and the ribosome binds, that there's some type of priming reaction. And that that priming reaction can be detected as some subtle conformational change in SEC61, but it's not totally clear what that change is. And that priming reaction is thought to somehow prepare it to be engaged by the signal peptide. So to try to understand the sequence of events, you'd ideally like structural information for each of these three steps. Now, this quiescent state, and I briefly mentioned this earlier, um, one can get from really a landmark structure done by X-ray crystallography of the homologue of the SEC61 channel called the SecY channel derived from archaea. And that was done by Tom Rappaport's lab a number of years ago. The prime state one can probably get a reasonable estimate from our structure of an empty ribosome bound to SEC61, because this is what presumably it would look like when a ribosome first arrives and the nascent chain and signal peptide have not engaged the channel yet. So that leaves us with this engaged channel. So how are we going to prepare this? And so if you've been paying attention, one can presumably use the same methods that we've used to generate um, intermediates in SRP complexes to similarly generate this engaged structure. So we again turn to our in vitro system where we can program it with a message that codes for a translocated protein. And here we used the protein prolactin. And this is an extremely well studied protein and a considerable amount of biochemistry in this field has established specifically which step during its translation it engages the SEC61 channel. So we could exploit all of this amassed information and look at an intermediate in which the signal seems to have stably and uh, significantly uh, engaged the SEC61 channel. And then what we did was we made a version of it that had an epitope tag on a flexible linker so that we could purify it. And we then solubilized such complexes in detergent, purified it via this epitope tag, and then reconstructed a three-dimensional structure. And so, again, the small subunit's in yellow, the large subunit is in light blue, the tRNA, which now you can see because this is in the process of translating a protein, is in purple, and SEC61 is here at the top in red. And so when you zoom in on the density for the SEC61 complex and account for all of the helices that comprise the SEC61 complex itself, 
it, there was density here that looked like one extra helix that we couldn't account for. And so that makes perfect sense because now this X61 complex should be engaged by a signal peptide, and we think that that's what that helix represents. And again, if one sharpens that, those density maps, you can see that actually in many of the good areas of SEC61, one can confidently place the backbone and many of the side chains of the SEC61 complex. And so we can then use this information to construct an atomic model of the SEC61 complex engaged by this extra helix, helical density, which we then can assign to a signal peptide. So with this structure then, we have snapshots of the quiescent state, of this primed state when the ribosome first arrives, and this engaged state at a slightly later step when a signal peptide has bound to the sex 61 complex. So what we can do then is to compare these three states and try to deduce at least some information on how a signal might be recognized. So there's a huge amount of information in these structures, but I'm going to focus just on a couple of very uh, specific uh, changes. So first, it's important to get some idea of what the quiescent state, the starting point of the channel, is likely to look like from the X-ray structure uh, of the Rappaport lab. So these structures can be um, a bit confusing to look at if you're not used to looking at them, but a simplified version is to think of it as a cylinder that has a seam in the middle, which is shown here in uh, orange and uh, lavender. And the helices that form this seam are colored similarly here in the, in the structure. And the idea of this seam is it is a lateral gate. So here is the plane of the membrane. And the idea is that this seam might part in order to allow proteins to enter the lipid bilayer. In addition, and it's not shown here, but it's shown in the cartoon, in the center of this channel is a plug. Because of course, when nothing is happening, the channel should be closed. And so there's a plug in the center that keeps the channel closed and a seam that might open in order to allow proteins to enter the lipid bilayer. So to make things a little bit easier to look at, I'm going to remove everything except for the helices of the lateral gate. Okay? And then we can ask what happens to that region of the SEC61 channel when a ribosome binds. So that's shown. Uh, oh. I forgot to mention, this is a view of the plug looking perpendicularly through the membrane. OK, so here's what happens when uh, we compare the quiescent state of the channel here to the state when the ribosome binds, but the signal peptide is not there yet. And what you can see in gray is the quiescent structure compared to the, uh, the, the primed state when the ribosome binds. And what you can see is that these helices of the lateral gate have moved ever so slightly. And what seems to have happened is that the orange half of the translocon, which is what binds the ribosome, uh, remains fixed relative to the other half. And so this lateral gate then has cracked ever so slightly. And I should emphasize that such small changes would be actually quite hard to be convinced by unless, of course, the resolution of the structures is sufficient to be confident that the change in approximately the diameter of a helix uh, is a reliable change. And so what we can see is that the lateral gate relative to this state where it's, where it's sealed is now partially cracked. Now, it hasn't cracked significantly, and the plug inside the channel remains there. So the channel is still closed. And so what we imagine is that this is the state when the signal first uh, arrives at the SEC61 channel. So the question is, what happens next? And so we'll move this over, and this is the structure where the signal is bound, and the signal now is shown in, in turquoise. And so what has happened here is that the lateral gate has moved further apart, and the signal now occupies a position between these helices of the lateral gate. So that's depicted here in this diagram, where, again, the lateral gate is further apart than in this primed state. And so what happens now is because the lateral gate has moved further apart, the channel actually opens. And I'm not going to show you these parts of the structure, but essentially when the lateral gate moves apart, the internal orifice inside the channel, deep in the channel, um, move, it becomes slightly wider. And there are a set of uh, amino acids 
that are at the constriction point, and that's where the plug seems to sit. So when that constriction point becomes wider, the plug seems to no longer have a stable binding position and therefore becomes disordered. And so we think that engagement of the signal is coupled to opening of the channel in the mammalian translocation pathway. And so that, of course, makes sense because you don't want to open the channel unless you have determined that the substrate that's coming out of the ribosome is a protein that you actually want to move across the membrane. So let's take a look then at what these movements in, uh, entail. So again, the orange part here, this half of the translocon as depicted in this, in this diagram, is the part that binds the ribosome. So we're just going to hold that fixed and ask, how does the other half of the molecule move relative to that? And what you can see, and again, I'm only showing you part of the structure, is that in the quiescent state, this helix, it's a helix called helix 2, um, is very closely juxtaposed with these orange helices of the lateral gate. And then during priming, uh, when the channel is still idle but it hasn't been engaged yet, the, the, this helix moves ever so slightly to crack the lateral gate, and then it moves further apart during the engaged state. And so this is perhaps easier to see in a movie, but, uh, which I'll show you in just a minute, but the question is, where is the signal binding relative to these uh, specific uh, states? And what's remarkable is that if you superimpose the signal uh, on these states, the signal's final position is very similar to where this helix 2 originally started. And that means that helix 2, whose job in the quiescent state is to form interactions with the other half of the lateral gate to keep the gate closed, um, now is replaced by a signal peptide which seems to form very similar interactions. And the implication of this is that only sequences that are more stable or better at replacing those interactions than the starting helix 2 will successfully displace helix 2 in order to bind at this position. So um, that's in many ways reminiscent of what happens with the SRP, as you'll see in a minute. So here then is the idea, is that helix 2 is in some ways kind of like a placeholder because that's where the, the signal will eventually bind. And when the signal shows up, this half of the molecule rotates away and the signal winds up occupying this position where helix 2 used to be. In the case of SRP, again, the place where the signal will eventually bind is in fact occupied in this state. So there's an amphipathic placeholder that's sitting there and when the signal emerges from the ribosome, that placeholder moves out of the way and the signal binds in that position. So why is this? So, so it, well, the first let me say that it's somewhat interesting and quite surprising that the mechanism of recognition in these two very different molecules is at some level analogous to each other. Obviously, the molecular details are all very different, but this idea that the signal winds up binding at a position to take over a set of interactions that had been made by an intramolecular placeholder is common to both of these systems. So what would the advantage of this be? And so for this, it's useful to then go back to the original question. How does molecular recognition of signals work when you have an incredible substrate diversity? So the number of proteins that have to be recognized by these two factors is literally in the thousands. And these proteins are all very different from each other. So the very typical molecular recognition of a set of very specific interactions, like a lock and key, would seem not to be possible here. And so what seems to be happening is, in both cases, what you have are intramolecular placeholders. And what these placeholders seem to do is they set an overall threshold of interactions that has to be overcome in order to get recognition of a signal as being an actual signal. And there are two independent sets of parameters, one that's set by SRP and its placeholder, and a different one that's set by SEC61 and its placeholder. And because these two sets of parameters are in some ways similar, obviously they both need hydrophobic signals to be uh, engaging them, they nevertheless are going to differ in the molecular details. 
And so the idea is that by having two slightly different sets of parameters, the overall fidelity is what, of what is allowed through both gates is uh, then increased. And so in that way, you can get a very wide range of sequences that have very little uh, similarity to each other in terms of the actual sequence, nevertheless be recognized because they both pass these thresholds that are set by the machinery of recognition, both by SRP and SEC61. So with that, I want to then end by just acknowledging that uh, I've had a tremendous group of people to work with over the past many years. Um, not only the people in my lab, but uh, colleagues uh, first at the National Institutes of Health, where I was for many years, and now at the uh, MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology. And of course, the work that I talked about here was carried out by Rebecca Voorhees, who really spearheaded the structural approach to this problem. And Rebecca is uh, now on her way to Caltech. The movies that I showed were done by Aaron Lewis, who's, who's shown over here second from the left. Thank you for listening. <laughs>